All right, um, our final presenter before we take a brief intermission is going to be Lina Kim, and she's going to tell us about her project that worked on optimizing the energy density of azobenzene functionalized solar thermal fuels via metallic phosphate framework. And um, her mentor was Ms. UC Liu. Thanks, Lina. <laughs> We live in a world of decreasing fossil fuels, but increasing energy demand. And in order to combat these problems, it's becoming increasingly imperative to develop a new renewable alternative energy source. Now, one of the most obvious sources of renewable energy is the sun. But when most people think solar power, they think solar panels. My project will be looking at an alternative method of harnessing solar energy, not solar panels, but solar thermal fuels. Now, solar thermal fuels, or STFs, are at their most fundamental level molecules. More specifically, they're photoactive molecules that can store energy in the form of chemical bonds. Now, most of the time, these molecules exist in the low energy off state. However, when they absorb energy, like sunlight, they can transition into the higher energy on structure. Now, when these molecules transition from on to off, from the high to the low energy structures, you can then release that energy for your own purposes. To look more specifically into the mechanism of STFs, we see that when a low energy structure absorbs a photon with energy H nu, it can be excited into the transition state over the activation energy barrier and settle into the higher energy structure, the on structure. Now the single most important value on this diagram is the delta H value, which is defined as the energy difference between the high and the low energy structures. Now the reason the delta H value is so important is because this is equivalent to the amount of energy that a single molecule can store per energy cycle. The other important value on this graph is the activation energy for the back reaction, E sub A prime, because that determines how much energy you need to trigger the release of energy step. Now, there are two benefits inherent to the mechanism of STFs. They're emission-free and they're renewable. However, there are still four common problems that many conventional solar thermal fuels struggle with. The first is that they're expensive. The second, is that they're photodegradable, or pho is that they photodegrade, which essentially means that after only a couple of cycles of use, these molecules break apart and can no longer store meaningful amounts of energy in between cycles. Third, they're not stable, and four, they're not energy dense, which can be taken to mean both per molecule and per volume, molecular and volumetric energy density. Now, an important term to note here is molecular energy density, which I'll be using interchangeably with the delta H value that I just mentioned throughout the rest of this presentation. And this is because we defined molecular energy density as delta H, the amount of energy that a single molecule can store. Now, what, identifying one solar thermal fuel molecule that can address all of these problems at the same time is key to improving both the economic and the environmental viability of solar thermal fuels. And it turns out that there is one molecule that performs well on all, most of these problems, azobenzene. Now, this structure might look a little bit familiar to you from the previous slides, but essentially, azobenzene is an incredibly attractive solar thermal fuel because it is cheap, resistant to photodegradation, and incredibly stable. The one downfall of azobenzene is that it isn't energy dense. However, there are ways to improve the molecular energy of azobenzene, and there are two specific ways you can improve this delta H value. You can increase it downwards by decreasing the energy of trans azobenzene. Alternately, you can increase delta H upwards by raising the energy of cis azobenzene. Now, my project specifically chose to simulate metallic phosphate frameworks and increase the molecular energy density of azobenzenes through these frameworks. We chose to simulate these metallic phosphate frameworks because of two reasons. First, their versatility and tunability, which, which essentially means that there are many variables that you can play around with within these structures in order to increase delta H. And second, they're easy to assemble, which is an incredibly important factor for future experimental designs of these frameworks. Now, essentially, we took these metallic phosphate frameworks, such as the zirconium phosphate framework you see on the screen, then attached azobenzene in both conformations. Now, these frameworks are able to increase delta H in both of the ways that I mentioned earlier. In the case of the trans azobenzene, the rigid framework is able to stabilize trans azobenzene, thus increasing delta H downwards. And for cis azobenzene, because the framework allows you to densely pack azobenzene molecules, it creates repulsions as the cis azobenzene folds over and clash with each other. And as a result, you're able to increase delta H upwards in the case of cis azobenzene. So essentially, we had six major structural variations, and for each 
structural variation, we created two versions, trans and cis. Then used the density functional theory in order to find the ground level energy states of each of these structures and thus find the difference between them to identify delta H. We essentially iterated these unit cells in all three axes in order to create stacked sheets of these structures. Now looking more closely at what kinds of structural variations we had, the first major type of structural variation was varying the core metal within these metal metallic phosphate frameworks. We chose four different metals, germanium, tin, titanium, and zirconium as box on the right. And the reason we chose these four metals is to capture a range of periodic trends across the table, such as atomic radius. Now, essentially, as you can see on the screen, these four structure frameworks are incredibly similar. However, there are slight differences which are caused by the different bond lengths that each of these metals have when bonding to the phosphorus within the rest of the framework. So essentially, because of these different bond lengths, there were corresponding differences in energy differences and energy density that we then analyzed. The second type of structural variation that we had were adding functional groups. Now we chose two functional groups, adding a benzene ring and a hydroxyl group, and these two functional groups were intended to increase delta H in opposite directions. So benzene ring was supposed to raise the energy of the cis azobenzene, whereas the hydroxyl group was intended to lower the energy of the trans azobenzene. Looking more closely into how they were intended to do this, we see that the benzene ring was an incredibly bulky side group that created clash with the cis azobenzene as it folded over, thus raising its energy. And for the hydroxyl groups, they were intended to they were attached to the tips of the azobenzene molecules in order to induce hydrogen bonding as circled in red and to stabilize the trans azobenzene structure, increasing delta H that way. Now, this diagram represents the magnitudes of the delta H values for all six structural variations with solid azobenzene lacking any framework for reference on the right. And in this case, what you're looking for from this diagram is larger bars. Bigger is better in this case because larger bars represent larger molecular energy densities, which is what we are trying to optimize with these frameworks. And here we see from the lengths of these bars in comparison to solid azobenzene that across the board, all six structural variations had greater molecular energy densities than azobenzene without a framework. This represents the incredible success of these metallic phosphate frameworks in increasing the molecular energy density of azobenzene, which also represents a large step forward in improving both the economic and environmental viability of azobenzenes and solar thermal fuels, as I mentioned earlier. Now, the picture is a little bit different for volumetric energy density. Now, if you look here, it can be seen that solid azobenzene has a greater volumetric energy density when compared to the six structural variations, despite having had a smaller molecular energy density, as seen from the previous diagram. Now, we postulate that this effect arose from two properties of the framework. So one, the metallic phosphate frameworks themselves take out volumes within the unit cells, but do not directly participate in the energy storage cycle. So that's one possible source. Now, the second possible source is that when we iterate these and have the stacked sheets of these structures, there has has to be a non-negligible space in between the sheets in order to guarantee that the structures do not clash and break apart. And that's the second reason why these six structural variations may have lower volumetric energy densities than solid azobenzene. And therefore, because volumetric energy density is an incredibly important factor when considering field applications of solar thermal fuels, we propose that future studies discover different ways to optimize not only molecular, but also volumetric energy densities. And we propose a specific design guideline in order to accomplish this. So essentially, we took the four core metals that we used, germanium, tin, titanium, and zirconium, and plotted their atomic radii against their respective volumetric energy densities. And we found a strong correlation between increasing increasing atomic radii and increasing volumetric energy densities as represented by the upward trends in this graph. So essentially, we recommend that future studies attempting to optimize volumetric energy density specifically use metals with atomic radii in between the highlighted column of 1.5 to 1.6 angstroms. Now when we look at what kinds of elements have radii in between that range, we see that they're highlighted in blue. But this study specifically recommends that future studies look at the elements highlighted in pink, indium and bismuth. And the reasoning behind this is that indium and bismuth share a couple of common properties. One, they're already used in the status quo electronics market. But two, they are also cheap, and three, they provide no toxicity concerns, at least relative to cadmium, which is right next to indium. So essentially, in conclusion, our project attempted to increase the molecular energy density of azobenzene as a solar thermal fuel by simulating metallic phosphate frameworks, which are incredibly novel. And we were successful because we were able to increase the molecular energy density of azobenzene molecules across 
all six structural variations that we attempted. In some cases, such as the zirconium framework, increasing molecular energy density eight-fold over conventional values that have been accomplished before. Now, this represents the fact that we optimize azobenzene for clean energy applications, which represents progress in terms of creating a more sustainable energy future. And finally, because volumetric energy density is an important factor for applications in the field, we also propose the elements indium and bismuth for future optimizations of volumetric energy density, thus representing the azobenzene STS properties and potential not only in the lab or the field, but also in the wider world. I'd like to acknowledge my spectacular mentor, Ms. Yusu Liu. I'd like to um, recommend my tutor, Peter Liu, all the way sitting in the back. He was instrumental in helping me throughout my presentation and other readers of my paper, sponsors, and of course, CEE, RSI, and MIT. Thank you. All right, um, yes, you first. So, so your project was concerned with sort of raising the enthalpy between the, the two end products. Yes, exactly. But you also mentioned this, this thing of the activation energy to get to go back mm -hmm. down. So did, did, did you look at that with any of your other compounds that had a favorable effect there? Do, do unfavorable things to the activation energy? So the question was, in the, recalling the energy diagram that I showed towards the beginning, um, the question was, by raising the enthalpy, the delta H values, was there an unfavorable effect in the um, E sub A prime, so the energy activation barrier to the back reaction? And my answer to that is, we didn't specifically look at the changes to the activation energy for the back reaction um, for our six structural variations. But there were certain papers that did look at structural vari or the changes to the activation energy barrier for similar structural variations, and those found that while there were slight increases in the activation energy for the back reaction, those were outweighed by the increases in delta H or the increases in enthalpy that were created in like all cases. Yes. So when you uh, when you take when you make these changes to azobenzene to affect the energy density, how does it how does it affect the stability of the photodegradability or the expense of the product? So. Although we didn't specifically look into this, again, we can refer to future study or refer to previous studies. And when I mentioned that azobenzene is an attractive STF, it's because usually it, making these slight structural changes to raise the energy of either the cis or lower the trans don't have a significant impact on stability. So they'll still be relatively stable even in the higher energy conformation, and they'll still have that significant delta H difference. Oh, sorry, the question was, <laughs> um, so the question was, by making these structural changes, do you make azobenzene less stable? And the answer is yes, but not to a significant degree to compromise its effectiveness as a slow thermal fuel. Other questions? Uh, yeah, Will. Um, I'm not sure if you discussed this already, but um, why do you suppose that uh, these metallic frameworks are uh, able to increase the molecular energy density considering that they don't participate directly in energy storage. So the where they're a oh so the question was how exactly do these frameworks increase the molecular energy density of azobenzene? And the answer to that is um, I mentioned in one of my earlier slides that they're able to increase delta H in two directions. So essentially for the trans azobenzene, although the framework doesn't directly participate in the energy storage cycle, it's able to stabilize trans azobenzene, which increases the delta H of the diagram I showed you earlier downwards. And then for cis azobenzene, because the framework allows you to pack azobenzene molecules more tightly together, you're creating clash in between the molecules, which raises the energy of the cis azobenzene upwards, this increasing delta H also upwards. Um, yes. So I think you mentioned it was a simulation, is that mm -hmm. right? Yes. So do you, can you say something about the inaccuracies of the simulation, like where it might fall down? Yeah. So the question was, I use the simulation to, or you use the simulation to create these frameworks. Uh, can you talk about the inaccuracies of the simulation we use? So to elaborate a little bit about the specific simulation that I used, um, essentially I use a software called Avogadro to create these uh, structures. And then I use a quantum computational um, method called density functional theory, or DFT. And the DFT is widely used in many fields, and it's incredibly accurate. But 
with current methods, they don't provide any uncertainty measures, which is one of the downfalls of DFT. So I can't speak specifically about the inaccuracies of my project, but the accuracy of density functional theory is incredibly affected by what version of DFT you use. And we use a version of DFT that was specifically optimized for structures like mine with a central framework and then adsorbed molecules on top. So um, based on this, we were able to uh, guarantee from previous studies that the DFT method we used was almost near chemical accuracy. So there wouldn't be any significant differences in terms of the results I pr uh, presented with increasing molecular energy density. Okay, I think that's actually all the time we have for questions. So in a minute, we're gonna take a brief intermission. Thank you, Lena. Um, but before we go, I just also wanted to recognize Dr. Silman. She's put so much work into this um, and all the students and all the TAs, everyone here really appreciates both of you.